Once upon a time, in a not-so-distant past, a peculiar phenomenon swept across the globe. It was an era when fear, paranoia, and an insatiable desire for power merged together in a bizarre and absurd way. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Cold War, the era when nuclear weapons became the ultimate fashion accessory. The whole thing started after World War II, when everyone was still reeling from the destruction and looking for someone to blame. English writer George Orwell used Cold War as a general term in his essay You and the Atomic Bomb. In the wake of the Allied victory, the Soviet Union had begun shaping Eastern Europe in their image, bringing the governments of many nations into line with Moscow. On February 9th, Joseph Stalin gave a speech in which he declared that war between the East and West was inevitable. Then, on March 5th at Westminster College in Fulton, Churchill's famous words ushered in the Cold War and framed the geopolitical landscape for the next 50 years. The term Iron Curtain was instantly iconic, capturing the essence of the post-World War II division between Eastern and Western Europe. By 1947, the United States adopted a policy of containment to restrict Soviet global power. This became a defining element of foreign policy in President Harry Truman's administration. Outlined in a speech delivered to Congress, what became the Truman Doctrine was an open promise of U.S. support to any country threatened by the Soviet Union. The policy of containment later informed the domino theory, which stated that one country falling to communism meant the surrounding countries were likely to fall as well. Boom. The United States wasn't alone in worrying about Stalin's push to extend Soviet influence westward and bring other states under communist rule. In 1948, the, the Soviet Union backed a communist coup in Czechoslovakia and launched a blockade of West Berlin, which had been divided into occupation zones controlled by communists in the East and capitalists in the West. To demonstrate a united front, the United States and its allies formed a transatlantic mutual defense alliance known as the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. Meanwhile, the Soviet Union had the Warsaw Pact, it was like a group of friends forced to hang out with the school bully. NATO and the Warsaw Pact were ideologically opposed and over time built up their own defenses starting an arms race that lasted throughout the Cold War. Picture this, two heavyweight champions, the United States and the Soviet Union, squaring off in the geopolitical arena. On one side, Uncle Sam, wearing a suit and tie, armed with capitalism and democracy. On the other side, Comrade Ivan, donning a fur hat and a stern expression, brandishing communism and the hammer and sickle. It was a time when every event was seen through the lens of the Cold War, a chess match between two grandmasters, clearly a metaphor for the superpower struggle. The Olympics, a battleground for ideological superiority. And don't even get me started on space exploration. The Soviets put the first satellite in orbit. Well, the Americans had to respond by putting a man on the moon. Following the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, Stalin called for an all-out crash program in atomic research and development. Both sides spent astronomical sums of money on nuclear weapons, with the goal of achieving mutually assured destruction. Because nothing says I'm watching you like a bunch of intercontinental ballistic missiles pointing at each other. Nuclear stockpiles grew larger and larger, while the rest of the world looked on in horror, wondering if they'd ever get to see their retirement savings. Just when you thought the arms race couldn't get any wackier, the Caribbean crisis stepped onto the stage. It all began when Fidel Castro took the reins of power in Cuba, transforming it into a communist utopia. The Soviets thought, hey, let's spice things up and ship some nukes to Cuba. Of course, the Soviet Union's decision to place missiles in Cuba was purely coincidental and had absolutely nothing to do with the fact that the United States had previously stationed nuclear weapons in Turkey. To fully appreciate the complexities and significance of the Caribbean crisis, we must delve into its multifaceted narrative in a separate video. In brief, the United States, led by President Kennedy, decided that the best way to handle the situation was to impose a naval blockade around Cuba. The world held its breath, waiting to see who would blink first. Negotiations between the two sides were tense, and it seemed like any slight misstep could trigger an all-out nuclear war. But then miraculously a compromise was reached. The Soviet Union agreed to remove its missiles from Cuba and in return the United States promised not to invade the island. And just like that the Caribbean crisis ended, leaving the world with a collective sigh of relief. It's true, a direct attack between the United States and Soviet Union never occurred. But the two superpowers did fight indirectly around the world, fueling several lengthy and brutal conflicts. Those conflicts, also known as proxy wars, entailed the United States and Soviet Union providing political, financial, and military support to friendly governments. 
the proxy wars took on many forms, from the jungles of Vietnam to the deserts of Afghanistan. Don't miss out on the video series exploring individual episodes of the Cold War. In the end, the Cold War left us with countless spy novels, a few famous movie franchises, and a truckload of anxiety disorders. Thankfully, we made it out relatively unscathed, and now we can look back and laugh at the ridiculousness of it all. Well, at least until the next geopolitical standoff comes along and makes us realize that maybe, just maybe, we haven't learned our lesson after all. If you're enjoying what you see, subscribing is the best way to show your support. Don't forget to check out our Patreon for exclusive perks. Thank you for your support, and may the comedic gods bless your sense of humor.